Welcome back to part four of our read aloud of Number of the Stars. Boy, we left off at a dramatic moment at the end of part three. Anne-Marie and her family are hiding Ellen because the Nazis that have taken over Denmark are now hunting down and arresting all of the nation's Jewish population. And in the middle of the night, with Ellen there pretending to be Anne-Marie's sister, there is a knock on the door. So let's see what happens. Anne-Marie eased the bedroom door open quietly, only a crack, and peeked out. Behind her, Ellen was sitting up, her eyes wide. She could see Mama and Papa in their nightclothes moving about. Mama held a lit candle, but as Anne-Marie watched, she went to a lamp and switched it on. It had been so long a time since they had dared to use the strictly rationed electricity after dark that the light in the room seemed startling to Anne-Marie, watching through the slightly open bedroom door. She saw her mother look automatically to the blackout curtains, making certain they were tightly drawn. Papa opened the front door to see soldiers. This is the Johansson apartment? A deep voice asked the question loudly in the terribly accented Danish. Our name is on the door, and I see you have a flashlight, Papa answered. What do you want? Is something wrong? I understand you are a friend of your neighbors, the Rosens, Mrs. Johansson, the soldier said angrily. Sophie Rosen is my friend, that is true. But please, could you speak more softly? My children are asleep. Then you will be so kind as to tell me where the Rosens are. He made no effort to lower his voice. I assume they're at home, sleeping. It's four in the morning, after all, Mom said. Anne-Marie heard the soldier stalk across the living room toward the kitchen. From her hiding place in the narrow sliver of door open doorway, she could see the heavy uniformed man, a holstered pistol at his waist, in the entrance to the kitchen, peering in toward the sink. Another German voice said, The Rosen's apartment is empty. We're wondering if they might be visiting their good friends, the Johansons. Well said Papa, moving slightly so that he was standing in front of Anne-Marie's bedroom door, and she could see nothing except the dark blur of his back. As you see, you're mistaken. There's no one here but my family. Then you will not object if we look around. The voice was harsh, and it was not a question. Seems we have no choice, Papa replied. But please, don't wake the children. There's no need to frighten the little ones. The heavy booted feet moved across the floor again and into the other bedroom. A closet door opened and closed with a bang. Anne-Marie eased her bedroom door closed silently. She stumbled through the darkness to the bed. Ellen, take off your necklace, she whispered urgently. Ellen's hands flew to her neck. Desperately, she began trying to unhook the tiny clasp. Outside the bedroom door, the harsh voices and heavy footsteps continued. I, I can't get it open. I never take it off. I can't even remember how to open it. Anne-Marie heard a voice just outside the door. What is here? Shh, her mother replied. My daughter's bedroom. They're sound asleep. Hold still, Anne-Marie commanded. This is going to hurt. She grabbed the little gold chain and yanked with all her strength, breaking it. As the door opened and light flooded into the bedroom, she crumpled it into her hand and closed her fingers tightly. Terrified, both girls looked up as the three Nazi, at the three Nazi officers who entered the room. One of the men aimed a flashlight around the bedroom. He went to the closet and looked inside. Then, with a sweep of his gloved hand, he pushed to the floor several coats and a bathrobe that hung from pegs on the wall. There was nothing else in the room except a chest of drawers, the blue decorated trunk in the corner, and a heap of Kirsty's dolls piled in a small rocking chair. The flashlight beam touched each thing in turn. Angrily, the officer turned toward the bed. Get up, he ordered. Come out here. Trembling, the two girls rose from the bed and followed him, brushing past the two remaining officers in the doorway to the living room. Anne-Marie looked around. These three uniformed men seemed different from the ones on the street corners. The street soldiers were often young, sometimes ill at ease, but Anne-Marie remembered how the giraffe had for a moment let his harsh pose slip and had smiled at Kirsty. But these men were older, and their faces were set with hate. Her parents were standing beside each other, their faces tense, but Kirsty was nowhere in sight. Thank goodness that Kirsty slept through almost everything. If they had woken her, she would have been wailing, or worse, she'd be angry and her fists would fly. Your names, the officer barked. Anne-Marie Johansson, and this is my sister. Quiet, let her speak for herself. Your name. He was glaring at Ellen. Ellen swallowed. Lisa, she said and cleared her throat. <clears throat> Lisa Johansson? The officer stared at them grimly. Now... Mama said in a stronger voice. 
You have seen that we are not hiding anything. May my children go back to bed. The officer ignored her. Suddenly, he grabbed a handful of Ellen's hair. She winced. He laughed scornfully. <laughs> you have a blonde child sleeping in the other room. You have this blonde daughter. He gestured toward Anne-Marie with his head. Where did you get the dark-haired one? He twisted the lock of Ellen's hair. From a different father? From the milkman, perhaps. Papa stepped forward. Do not speak to my wife in such a way. Let go of my daughter or I will report you for such treatment. Hmm. Maybe you got her someplace else, the officer continued with a sneer. From the Rosens, perhaps. For a moment, no one spoke. Then Anne-Marie, watching in panic, saw her father move swiftly to the small bookcase and take out a book. She saw that he was holding the family photograph album. Very quickly, he searched through its pages, found what he was looking for, and tore out three pictures from three separate pages. He handed them to the German officer who released Alan's hair. You will see each of my daughters, each with her name written on the photograph, Papa said. Anne-Marie knew instantly which photographs he had chosen. The album had many snapshots, all the poorly focused pictures of school events and birthday parties, but it also contained a portrait taken by a professional photographer of each girl as a tiny infant. Mama had written in her delicate handwriting the name of each baby daughter across the bottom of those photographs. She realized, too, with an icy feeling why Papa had torn them from the book. At the bottom of each page, below the photograph itself, was written the date, and the real Lisa Johansson had been born 21 years earlier. Kirsten Elizabeth, the officer read, looking at Kirsty's baby picture. He let the photograph fall to the floor. Anne Marie, he read the next, glanced at her, and dropped the second photograph. Lisa Margaret, he read finally, and stared at Ellen for a long, unwavering moment. In her mind, Anne-Marie pictured the photograph that he held. The baby, wide-eyed, propped against a pillow, her tiny hand holding a silver teething ring, her bare feet visible below the hem of an embroidered dress, the wispy curls of dark hair. The officer tore the photograph in half and dropped the pieces on the floor. Then he turned the heels of his shiny boots grinding into the pictures and left the apartment. Without a word, the other two officers followed. Papa stepped forward and closed the door behind him. Anne-Marie relaxed the clenched fingers of her right hand, which still clutched Ellen's necklace. She looked down and saw that she had imprinted the Star of David into her palm. We need to think what to do, Papa said after they had left. They're suspicious now. To be honest, I thought that if they came here at all, and I hoped they wouldn't, they would just glance around, see that we had no place to hide anyone, and would go away. I'm sorry I have dark hair, Ellen murmured. It made them suspicious. Mama reached over quickly and took Ellen's hand. You have beautiful hair, Ellen, just like your mama's. Don't you ever be sorry for that. Weren't we lucky that Papa thought so quickly and found those pictures? And weren't we lucky that Lisa had dark hair when she was a baby? It turned blonde later on when she was two or so. <laughs> Papa added with a chuckle, and in between she was bald for a bit. Ellen and Anne-Marie both smiled tentatively. For a moment their fear was eased. Tonight was the first time Anne-Marie realized suddenly that Mama and Papa had spoken of Lisa. The first time in three years. Outside, the sky was just beginning to lighten. Mrs. Johansson went to the kitchen and began to make tea. I've never been up so early before, Anne-Marie said. Ellen and I will probably fall asleep in school today. Papa rubbed his chin for a moment, thinking. I don't think we can take the risk of sending you girls to school. It's possible they will be looking for the Jewish children in the schools. Not go to school? Ellen asked in amazement. My parents have always told me that education is the most important thing, that whatever happens, I must get an education. This will only be a short vacation, Ellen. For now, your safety is the most important thing. I'm sure your parents would agree. Inga, Papa called Mama in the kitchen, and she came to the doorway with a teacup in her hand and a questioning look on her face. Yes? We need to take the girls to Heinrichs. You remember what Peter told us. I think today is the day to go to your brother's. Mrs. Johansson nodded. I think you're right, but I'll take them. You stay here. Stay here and let you go alone? Of course not. I wouldn't send you on a dangerous trip alone. Mama put a hand on Papa's arm. If only I go with the girls, it will be safer. They are unlikely to suspect a woman and her children. But if they are watching us and they see all of us leave, if they're aware the apartment is empty, that you don't go to your office this morning, then they will know. 
Then it will be dangerous. I'm not afraid to go alone. It was very seldom that Mama disagreed with Papa. Anne-Marie watched his face and knew that he was struggling with the decision. But finally he nodded, though reluctantly. I'll pack some things, Mama said. What time is it? Papa looked at his watch. Not quite five. Heinrich will still be there. He leaves around five. Why don't you call him? Papa went to the telephone. Ellen looked puzzled. Who's Heinrich and where does he go at five in the morning? Anne-Marie laughed. He's my uncle, my mother's brother. He's a fisherman. They leave very early, all the fishermen, each morning. Their boats go out at sunrise. Oh, Ellen, you're going to love it there. It's where my grandparents lived, where Mama and Uncle Heinrich grew up. It's so beautiful, right on the water. You can stand at the edge of the meadow and look across to Sweden. She listened while Papa spoke on the telephone to Uncle Heinrich, telling him that Mama and the children were coming for a visit. Ellen had gone into the bathroom and closed the door. Mama was still in the kitchen, so only Anne-Marie was listening. It was a very puzzling conversation. So, Heinrich, is the weather good for fishing? Papa asked cheerfully and listened briefly. Then he continued, Yes, I'm sending Inga to you today with the children, and she'll be bringing you a carton of cigarettes. Yep, just one, he said after a moment. Anne-Marie couldn't hear Uncle Heinrich's words. Oh, there are a lot of cigarettes available in Copenhagen now, if you know where to look, he went on. And so there will be others coming to you as well, I'm sure. But that wasn't true. Anne-Marie was quite certain it wasn't true. Cigarettes were the thing that Papa missed the way Mama missed coffee. He complained often. He had complained only yesterday that there were no cigarettes in the stores. The men in his office, he said, making a face, smoked anything. Sometimes they dried grasses rolled in paper and the smell was awful. Why was Papa speaking that way? Almost as if he were speaking in code. What was Mama really talking to Uncle Heinrich about? Then she knew. Or what was Mama really taking to Uncle Heinrich? Then she knew. It was Ellen. The train ride along the Danish coast was very beautiful. Again and again they could see the sea from the windows as they traveled north. Anne-Marie had made this trip often to visit her grandparents when they were alive, and later, after they were gone, to see the cheerful, sun-tanned, unmarried uncle whom she loved so much. But the trip was new to Ellen, who sat with her face pressed to the window, watching the lovely homes along the seaside, the small farms and villages. Look, Anne-Marie exclaimed and pointed to the opposite side, Clampenborg and the Deer Park. Oh, I wish we could stop here just for a little while. Mama shook her head. Not today, she said. The train did stop at the small Clampenborg station, but none of the few passengers got off. Have you ever been there, Ellen? Mama asked, but Ellen said no. Well, someday you'll go. You'll walk through the park and you will see hundreds of deer, tame and free. Kirsty wriggled to her knees and peered through the window. I don't see any deer, she complained. Oh, they are there, I'm sure. Possibly hiding in the trees, Mama told her. The train started again. The door at the end of their car opened and two German soldiers appeared. Anne-Marie tensed. Not here on the train, too. They were everywhere. Together, the soldiers strolled through the car, glancing at passengers, stopping here and there to ask a question. One of them seemed to have something stuck in his teeth. He probed with his tongue and distorted his own face. Anne-Marie watched with a kind of frightened fascination as the pair approached. One of the soldiers looked down with a bored expression on his face. Where are you going? he asked. Gilalish, Mama replied calmly. My brother lives there, and we're going to visit him. The soldier turned away, and Anne-Marie relaxed. Then, without warning, he turned back. Are you visiting your brother for the new year? He asked suddenly. Mama stared at him with a puzzled look. New year? It is only October. And guess what? Kirsty exclaimed suddenly in a loud voice, looking at the soldier. Anne-Marie's heart sank, and she looked at her mother. Mama's eyes were frightened. Shh, Kirsty, don't chatter so. Kirsty paid no attention. As usual. She looked cheerfully at the soldier, and Anne-Marie knew what she was about to say. She was going to say something about this being our friend Ellen, and it's her new year. But she didn't. Instead, Kirsty pointed at her feet. I'm going to visit my Uncle Heinrich, she chirped, and I'm wearing my brand new shiny black shoes. The soldier chuckled and moved along. Anne-Marie gazed through the window again. The trees, the Baltic Sea, and the cloudy October sky passed in a blur as they continued north along the coast. Oh, smell that air, Mama said when they stepped off the train and made their way to the narrow street. Isn't it lovely and fresh? 
It always brings back memories for me. The air was breezy and cool and carried the sharp but not unpleasant smell of salt and fish. High against the pale clouds, seagulls soared and cried out as if they were mourning. Mama looked at her watch. I wonder if Heinrich will be back yet. Yeah, it doesn't matter. The house is always unlocked. Come on, girls, we'll walk. It isn't far, just a little under two miles, and it's such a nice day. We'll take the path through the woods instead of the road. It's a little longer, but it's so pretty. Didn't you love the castle when we went through Helsinger, Ellen? Kirsty asked. She had been talking about Kronborg Castle ever since they had seen it. Sprawling, massive, and ancient beside the sea from the train. I wish we could have stopped to visit the castle. Kings live there. And queens. Anne-Marie sighed in exasperation with her little sister. They do not. They did in the old days, but there aren't any kings there now. Denmark only has one king anyway, and he lives in Copenhagen. But Kirsty had pranced away, skipping along the sidewalk. Kings and queens, she sang happily. Kings and queens. Mama shrugged and smiled. Oh, let her dream, Anne-Marie. I did the same when I was her age. She turned, leading the way along a tiny, twisting street. They headed toward the outskirts of the village. Things have hardly changed here since I was a girl. My Aunt Gita lived there in that house, she pointed. She's been dead for years, but the house is exactly the same. She always had wonderful flowers in her garden. Mama peered over the, the low stone wall and looked at the few flowering bushes as they passed the house. Well, maybe they still do, but it's the wrong time of year. There are just those few chrysanthemums left. Oh, and see, over there. My best friend, her name was Helena. She lived in that house. Sometimes I used to spend the night with her, but more often she came to my house on weekends. It was just more fun to be in the country. My brother Heinrich always teased us, though, she continues with a, with a chuckle. He told us ghost stories and scared us half to death. The sidewalk ended and Mama turned onto a dirt path bordered by trees. When I walked along each morning into town for school, my dog followed me this far. At the end of the path, he would turn and go back home. I guess he was a country dog and didn't like being in town. And you know what? I had named him Trophist. It means faithful. And it was just the right name for him. Because what a faithful dog he was. Oh, every afternoon, he was always right here, just waiting for me to return. He knew the right time somehow. Sometimes, as I come around this bend, even today... I feel as I might, if I might come upon Trophus, waiting still with his tail wagging. But the path was empty today. No people, no faithful dogs. Mama shifted the bag she was carrying from one hand to the other, and they walked on through the woods until the path opened to a meadow dotted with cows. Here the path skirted the edge of the field along a fence, and beyond it they could see the gray sea ruffled by wind. The breeze moved the high grass. At the end of the pasture they entered the woods again, and Anne-Marie knew they would soon be there. Uncle Heinrich's house was in a clearing just beyond these woods. Do you mind if I run ahead? Anne-Marie asked suddenly. I want to be the first to see the house. Well, go on then, Mama told her. Run ahead and tell the house we've come. Then she put her arm around Ellen's shoulders and added, And say that we've brought a friend. And we'll stop there for part four of Number of the Stars. Uh, at least for now, they have managed to avoid very serious danger, even life-threatening danger, by convincing the Nazis that Ellen was indeed their daughter, lying about her being Lisa. And they've now gone outside of the city. We'll see how long that safety lasts as we pick up with part five next time as we continue reading Lois Lowry's Number of the Sars.